Organic Herba Mate. For those of you asking, I always want to stay on top of what I'm drinking. Hello, friends. Hello. We are live with a different angle. Yes. I don't have my entire wall of Dave set up, but I've got a little something. I got some familiar friends in the background there. And let me just make sure I got the right microphone happening. I believe I do. And I do. Very good. Well, hello there. Yes. Welcome to Ask Gallimella about your theories for, which is basically open Q&A, but by, you know, questions are one thing, but, uh, you know, theories are really what everyone wants to talk about. So this is, uh, I've been doing a bunch of chapter readings, and if you've missed any of those lately, then check those out there. Of course, on the feed, I've done Winds of Winter, and I've done some just general Song of Ice and Fire stuff. I did, uh, what, what did we do? Clash of Kings prologue with Maester Crescent. We did uh, we did Reek Two on Friday the Thirteenth. That was a really fun one. That was a great, uh, great, great stream. We had a ton of fun there. And um, today we're gonna uh, basically we you know been doing very topical stuff. So some of you have been sending in super chats and saying, oh, I got an off topic question. Can I uh, you know can I ask you about that? So today's your day. Come on through. And I've already, some of you have sent in uh, paypal.me mythical astronomy donations already. So I've got a few questions already queued up. Oh, yes. Um, and we're going to start with a little a little theory, a little discovery made by uh, my dear friend Minty in the chat. We were talking last night about A Song of Ice and Fire. And uh, she suddenly blurted out some, some brilliance. She's like, uh, you know... The weirwood tree, we were talking about weirwood seeds and jojen paste. And she's like, Yeah, the weirwood trees don't have seeds because they don't have flowers or fruit. And I was all like, Duh. Like, we've been debating about this forever. You know, or do the weirwoods actually have seeds? Because we're told that the weirwood paste that Bran eats is a ground up paste of weirwood seeds. And, you know, I and other people suspect that the, there is no there are no weirwood seeds and that weirwoods are in fact more like a fungus organism where the main organism is underground and the trees themselves are almost like the fruit they're the mushroom caps popping up above ground but we see that the weirwood organisms are huge underground blood raven's cave is hundreds of feet below the ground thank you carolina blues thanking me for all the jojen is paste yes it's most likely true uh thanks for all the hard work oh thank you carolina and if you want to, of course, the Jojen, the definitive Jojen paste video is on my channel called Weirwood Paste is People. So if you haven't seen that, that's so got some of my best jokes. Um, so, yes, uh, I've long suspected that the idea of Jojen being weirwood seeds is somewhat of a euphemism because weirwood trees are grown from blood sacrifice or mutated through blood sacrifice. They're fed. They drink blood. They're fed blood. So basically what I think is going on is that weirwood seeds are people. That's that's people are the seeds. And again, it, you know, there are no flowers. And there are no there's no uh there's no pine cones, there's no weirwood fruits, and trees always have some kind of way of dropping seeds, of course, so that they can reproduce. And the fact that the weirwoods do not have any fruit or flowers that anyone has ever observed in any season basically clinches the fact that weirwoods do not have seeds. There are no such thing as weirwood seeds. Weirwoods are basically a magical organism. They don't have a normal biology, and they probably are, I'm guessing that they are just part of the planet, that they weren't actually planted, that they 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 grow up from the ground and they're just part of Westeros. So. Yeah, and that is definitely Jimi Hendrix in the background. Absolutely. Jimi Hendrix is God. Uh, so let's go ahead. Now that I've so thank you, Minty, for that. Uh kicking off our our weirwood. And and I will just say, of course, any theories are welcome. You can ask me about anything. But uh, if you have particularly weirwood theories, that would be great. I did use a weirwood picture for the title of this stream. Uh, but let's go ahead and check out some of the PayPal's that have come in already, because there's a bunch. You guys are awesome. 
And it's going to start off with Greg from nine hours ago. Last night, asked if I can give a hell yeah to his friend Shane who passed this week. So Shane, rest in power and peace. Hell yeah, brother. And my condolences to Shane's family, of course. Greg, a core mythical astronomy family member and longtime patron. Jason Gonding, also another longtime patron, says, uh, keep the magic going. Really enjoyed the recent read-along streams. And he's reminding me that uh, I should really give him a nickname, as well as some of you other guys. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Definitely going to be some updated nicknames on the... Uh, on the new five-part Nightbringer series. If you missed the announcement the other day, uh, my new Moon Meteors video turned out to be not so much a shorter summary of my Moon Meteors theory, but but a full hour and 20 minutes of updated Moon Meteor madness. And so I'm going to break it into five little videos instead of one giant video. We're going to see if that juices the YouTube algorithm a little better. YouTube really seems to like those 10 to 20 minute videos. So basically five videos, I'm going to put them out either five days in a row or maybe like every other day. And uh, I'll show you the artwork for that actually, because I have it complete now. This is really exciting. It's going to be my magnum opus, the song of ice and fire. Let's say. And I made some fancy artwork with all that art, cool art from the uh, Augsburg Book of Signs, Miraculous Signs. And it's pretty dope. So let me just share the screen with you. I'll show you that. Where you guys get your theories and questions queued up for me. So that's part five. Let's start with part one, why don't we? Nightbringer part one, the bleeding star sort of introduced the th whole theory. Part two, Legends of the Long Night. We'll dive into the two main myths that have the evidence of meteors or two or three main myths that have evidence of meteors. Going to tie the Bloodstone Emperor and Dawn and all that stuff together. Part three is basically Red Sword of a Shy. Going to be a, a very quick version of the Great Empire of the Dawn theory told from the standpoint of how it joins Azor Ahai to Westeros and all of the different meteor legends together. Part four, moon dragons, need I say more? There they are, the moon dragons. And as above, so below, I slow walked the symbolism in this one. I sort of started with the logical arguments about the long night and what could have caused it and uh, backed into the symbolism. So this is going to have all the dragon stones and Azor High and Nissa Nissa as the sun and moon, alchemical wedding type of stuff. So going to be a cool series. I'm very excited about that. I've finished the first two mostly, except for the quotes. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's coming there. As above, so below. Gabe the Griffin likes that one. All right. Yeah, so definitely get hyped. And let me pull the Super Chats over to a different window. <clears throat> Cool. I also made some changes with the birds. I soundproofed the room and moved the stuff around. So hopefully they're not uh, hearing me as much and coming through as much. We'll see. It's all about Cleo. I can ignore Goose's little screams. But if Cleo starts pitching a fit, that's when the shit hits the fan. So we'll see. We'll see. Andrew Parrish via PayPal.me says, sending you some incredible musical vibes. Oh, yeah, totally. I, li I listened to this earlier. Uh, it was, what was the name of the band? What happens when you turn the devil down by the mystery lights? Yeah, that was totally dope. Kind of retro soul feel. So the mystery lights, if you guys like 60s, 70s style soul R&B, kind of like Krang Bin or Budo's Band, if you're into that stuff. <clears throat> Which I am. Joe McCown says, can you speculate on the heart of winter? Oh, yes. I think it's such a cool, mysterious location. Teased. But it's hard to imagine any of our POVs getting there unless it's Bran in a vision. Frozen Weirwood, Orly Blackstone, both. Also, what symbolically would it mean for any of our characters to travel there? Joe, tossing me a softball to warm me up here. This is great. Thanks, buddy. <clears throat> yeah, um, I guess let me move it just in case. Thanks, uh, thanks, C-Bob. You know, I do try to keep the, the, the evidence to a minimum. 
of just because YouTube is, uh, you can never really figure out what they demonetize for. Like the Reek stream, they said it was lim only qualified for limited advertisers for like, five hours and then they approved it so it cost me a little bit of money i have no idea why they did that i didn't there wasn't any inappropriate content but whatever oh good i got some Krangbin uh fans that's cool yeah it's a freaking weird uh spelling of the band but i put it on the screen there if you look, want to look them up they're totally awesome super chill music there let me see if my tea's ready so the heart of winter friends the heart of winter there's recently been some new heart of winter artwork that i found that is super amazing i i'm wondering if like some of these artists out there are like listening to some of my podcasts i know the unseen westeros guys love my stuff and that um i've managed to influence some of the shy artwork so that's definitely a feather in my cap uh but yeah oh these two yeah, these are awesome. Well, so only one of these is actually the Heart of Winter. The other one's just a frozen tree that I grabbed because it made me think of the Heart of Winter. But check this out. So this one is called Frozen Weirwood Tree by Bo Zonavade. Z-O-N-N-E-V-E-I-D. Bo Zonavade. So this is very close to what I think we might see in the heart of winter to answer your question. <laughs> um, frozen weirwood tree is a very strong bet. So let's talk about the house of the undying. Um, the house of the undying gives us probably our best symbolic model of the heart of winter. <clears throat> and the, the clues here are, are key in that the uh, there's two key ones. So there's a big floating blue heart of course, in the middle of the House of the Undying. And this makes you think of the Heart of Winter, especially because it's beating with blue light and the Undying are described as cold blue shadows. Now, the White Walkers are, of course, white shadows and pale shadows. Oh, and I missed a super chat. Let me highlight that real quick. And, uh... Oh, it was one with a question. Okay, I'll grab it after I'm done answering this question. Carolina Blues. So the, um... House of the Undying, you've got all these cold blue shadows and they're gathered around a blue heart and they want to lure Danny into a trap, steal her dragons, suck away her life and her fire. Remember, that's the end of the vision. She wakes up and they're all over her and she's thinking to herself, they needed the life, the fire. So they're trying to vampire her, trying to do some magical thing where they consume her energy or you know, maybe they're literally going to eat her. I don't know. But you can clearly see that this is a lot like what we might expect the others to try to do with Danny or John or any blood of the dragon is to consume their fiery dragon power and absorb them, maybe even turn them into a white walker and use their magic, sort of flip it around. Um, the show did something like that, where they took dead Viserion and when Night King animated him, he now had blue fire. Uh, so it's kind of like almost implied that the fire magic of the dragons has been flipped over to the powers of ice and the others. I definitely think that that is something that's happening in the books. In fact, I think the original, that's the whole point of Azor High becoming Night's King, which is one of my theories. Check out the Night's King Azor High video. Is that essentially when he goes into the Weirwood Net and steals that power, as we talked about in the Bolton stream yesterday, he then flips from fire to ice and becomes the father of the others. And that's why the others have this burning ice magic. They have cold blue star eyes. And stars, of course, are the hottest things in the galaxy. Blue stars are actually among the hottest stars. But he describes them as burning with cold fire. So we've got this fiery language, but flipped to ice. And I think that's just something that George loves. He loves that juxtaposition. You know, white shadow is a juxtaposition. Um... And he's got these, you know, black fire is another one that he likes. So. So going back to the heart of winter and the uh, house of the undying, they're showing us the others gathered around a cold blue heart and they're waiting to trap Danny the dragon and, and defeat her. And what happens instead, Drogon burns them all to a crisp. And this is exactly what we want Drogon to do to the White Walkers, right? Torch them. 
Um, so I think this is a big clue about, about the uh, heart of winter. And of course, the undying subsist on shade of the evening. Shade of the evening, of course, makes you think of the long night. So these are shadows that consume the evening, that, that dwell in the power of the evening. And the shade of the evening comes from the, uh, you know, those black trees that everyone has identified as opposites of the weirwoods, like their color inverted to the weirwoods, right? They have black bark and blue leaves instead of white bark and red leaves. Both trees produce a psychedelic substance that makes you trip and see visions. <clears throat> so I've always suspected that the, un that those shade trees, they are telling us about weirwoods. Basically, we're seeing an inverted weirwood or a corrupted weirwood tree. That's what the shade of the evening trees seem to represent. And they're under the province of the others. So this fits in with all the other evidence that the White Walkers come from the weirwoods. They've been exiled from the weirwoods. They retain some sort of connection to the weirwoods. <clears throat> and so we have these cold blue shadows gathered around a cold blue heart, which seems to represent the heart of winter. And they're, they're living inside a grove of these shade trees. So when we go to the heart of winter, I expect to see a frozen weirwood tree or perhaps even a shade of the evening tree. I'm unsure if the shade of the evening trees are mostly symbolism or if they actually are corrupted weirwood trees. Either one is possible. I think they're symbolism. So I think that what we'll see is a weirwood tree that's been frozen. And maybe it'll be black and look dying or something. But we could find shade of the evening trees up there. Um, coated in ice. That could be too. <clears throat> and uh, I also think that oily black stone is a good chance. Definitely a good chance of finding oily black stone on the Isle of Faces and or the Heart of Winter. Just as we do in a shy. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen there. Carolina Blue says, what are the faces? They are described as angry men, but didn't the faces exist before the first men came to Westeros? What faces are they? So this is kind of uncertain. There is some evidence that the weirwood faces represent, they, they look a little bit like the green seer inside the tree um, because the Stark tree has a long face and Theon thinks that it looks like Bran when Bran's talking to him. <clears throat> So that could be. Uh, but mostly the question here is who carved the faces and when? I suspect the children didn't used to carve the faces and that originally they could use the weirwood tree magic without mutilating them and stuff. And I think the face carving is evidence of Azor High having invaded the weirwood net and corrupted it. And again, check out the Ramsey, uh, the Reek 2 stream that we did, which had a ton of talk about the Boltons. At the end of the stream... I broke down the symbolism of the Boltons, which gives us a ton of clues about Azor High stealing the power of the Weirwoods. Just as the Boltons steal people's skins and their sigil, the flayed man, basically looks like a Weirwood tree because a Weirwood tree has bone white bark as if it's a skull that's been stripped of its skin. And then it's got this bleeding face. It's got these bleeding hands. And it's even standing there with its, if you imagine the, the face of the tree is the head and the branches with the hand leaves as the arms. It's basically the upper half of the Bolton sigil. So the flayed man of Bolton is a symbolic representation of the weirwoods. And they're telling us that evil Azor high people like Roos and Ramsey, they steal the skins of other people to gain their magic. And that's just what Azor high did. So I give you the longer version on the Ramsey two streams to so check that out. Um, but the main thing about the faces is that the faces show us the weirwood trees being tortured and in pain or angry, like you said. Um, and this is evidence that they've been violated. They've been invaded. And everything about them screams, you know, horror and abomination. And essentially that abomination was Azor High murdering Nissa Nissa, a child of the forest, to use to gain sort of a portal into the weirwoods. And that is what he did. He got in there and stole the magic and caused a whole bunch of trouble. Shane Hawley says, what do you think of the bolt on theory that Roos is a skin stealing other human hybrid or possible Knights King? So 
This is another one where you, you got to watch the Ramsey two stream that I did or the Reek two stream from Friday. Um, we went into bolts on real heavy. I laid out the entire theory and we talked about it. I think that it is credible and I think it's inevitable because we see that Vermeer, when he's dying, he tries to steal somebody else's skin in order to live. The, the urge, the drive to live is strong. Um, and I think that it's inevitable that green seers and skin changers would have done the same thing that Vermeer did at some point and, and tried to, uh, to, to live forever by stealing people's skin. So I might make a bolt on video sort of in the vein of the Jojen paste video, sort of a half conspiratorial fun type thing. But, uh, I think it's coming. I think I want to do it. So check out the reek Two live stream for my take on bolt on. It was a it was a fun stream. Definitely recommend that one. So thanks, Joe, for asking me about the heart of winter. Raza asks, "What's my take on Jane Westerling? We know that she'll be in the prologue of Winds of Winter. Do you think she'll die in the prologue, or do you think there'll be more to her story?" Well, I think Jane really is. I mean, everyone's the hero of their own story, but Jane really is a very tertiary character. I don't think there's a lot more to her story. I think that she's going to serve a role in the Blackfish Stoneheart Riverlands plot. And she could die at any point. She certainly is expendable in the plot terms. Um, the idea of her being pregnant with Rob's heir is probably a plot device more than, than an heir. Like, I don't think Rob's heir is actually going to exist or needs to exist simply the idea that she might be pregnant serves as a plot device. So kind of doubt she is. Um, and she very well could die in the prologue. A lot of people do die in the prologue. So thank you for that question. I do like Jane Westerling. I think she's an interesting character. And I feel for her because it seems like her grandma played her. It seems like she really did love Rob. Um, so it's kind of kind of tragic there. It seems like George is showing us just yet another angle of the cruelty of medieval sort of uh, politics and arranged marriage, you know, shit. But I don't have a strong take on the Jane Westerling stuff. So don't definitely don't take that as gospel or anything like that. Thomas says, there's so much mythology surrounding the character of Garth Greenhand. Indeed. He reminds me of Tom Bombadil from Lord of the Rings. Both characters are rumored to be the original inhabitants of their respective mythical lands with powers related to nature. Sure, I can see that. Um, Tom Bombadil fought Barrow Whites in the books. Did Garth do the same in the world of ice and fire? Um, Garth Greenhand had a throne, the oaken seat of Living Oak. And there's an obvious crossover to the Weirwoods here, but also the Druids in Celtic mythology put a lot of emphasis on the oak tree. Obviously they did. That's That's definitely true. <clears throat> Druids may have made blood sacrifices and Garth Greenhand may have done this as well. All of this mythology fits together in some way, but I'm not sure what it might be pointing to. I suspect there were various ways of controlling Planetos via weirwood or oaken thrones in the past. <clears throat> so, a um, couple things there. Check out the Green Zombies series. So, go way back in my video feed. Sacred Order of Green Zombies 1, 2, and 3, some of my original hits. Um, all of the Night's Watch characters have Garth Green Man symbolism, and they seem to be res like they, their symbolism is that of resurrected green men, and they're the ones battling the others and the whites. So, also check out the mythology of the Barrow King, which I talked about in that series um, from the Barrow Lens. It seems to be the end of Garth Greenhand's legendary story. And it also implies a curse that falls on people that makes them look dead. So he has a few ties to the whites, uh, but most of it is, is the idea of uh, resurrected Night's Watchmen like Cold Hands or Jon Snow that have that green man symbolism. <clears throat> what What do I think would happen if a weirwood drank the blood of a fire white? Winterfell's Black Lake reminds me of Barrack's blood. Um, gosh, I don't know. It's probably like an extra high calorie meal, I would say. And um, see, Thomas is saying that he sent me a couple on August 4th. 
So let me pull open a different window and see if I can find those. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Ooh, this is not going to be easy to do. Okay, I will come back to that and see if I can find those, Tom. Otherwise, be patient with me and I will email you back. Let's see here. Somebody's pointing out that Barrick did bleed a lot in the in the cave full of weirwood roots when Sandor slayed, uh, slayed him. That's true. They didn't seem to freak out, so he could probably handle it. Uh, Moira says, how are the still black pools connected to the symbolism of the weirwoods? Oh, nice. The PayPal questions are following along on the same, uh, on the same theme. So symbolically, the black pond represents the void. It represents the realm of chaos, you know, the nether realm. Definitely that is the realm from which the green seers operate. And that's why, uh, that's why they talk about. Uh, Bran talks about like uh, growing stronger in the dark and drawing his power from the darkness. Uh, Blood Raven, you know, let darkness be your mother's milk and your blanket. So the black pools all represent that realm. And I talked about a lot in my Vedic Danny video um, where we talked about the womb of the world, which just like the pond of Winterfell is rumored to be um, <clears throat> rumored to be bottomless. And is black as well. And there's also the pool in the House of the Undying. And Dylan, let me see if I can find yours too as well, buddy. So if I can figure out how to search this with the name. Oh, totally. That did work. Here we go. Awesome. Okay, so I figured out how to do this. So Dylan with a 666 from the other day. Ah, gotcha, buddy. I think House Royce used to have dragon steel armor. Did I finish with the Black Pond? It's um definitely the longer explanation is in the Vedic Origins of Danny video, but basically it represents the void, and the void is a vehicle for transformation. It's where you go to be reborn. It's where you're born from or reborn from. <coughs> So it is the middle head of Trios. It is the vehicle for transformation and rebirth. And that's why it's so important. And you see Danny going in bloody and pregnant and then coming out. Uh, it's definitely a rebirth ritual. And then Ned cleanses the blood off of his sword. It's a cleansing ritual. Uh, so, so on and so forth. People are offered up to the weirwood there. Oh, okay. So Thomas is okay. Nice. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, yeah, I'm multitasking here, but I'll get it. So he was asking about the glass candles. And he's asking basically about what we saw on the show. Can obsidian be used to create white walkers? I don't think so. I think that's something the show made up, Thomas. I doubt that they sort of used dragon glass to do everything like it stopped Benjamin's white walker infection but it also created the night king it didn't really make sense to me but then it also kills the whites um so it's and the others so it's like does it kill them or make them i never understood that <clears throat> so i think i don't think obsidian is involved in white walker creation at all um i think it just kills them i do wonder about What's the difference between a dragon glass knife and a glass candle that is obviously lighting up with with light or a certain kind of fire? So could we see the 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 obsidian knives of the Night's Watch light up on fire like little light bringers or somebody just going to pull a candle out of a sconce and start swinging it around at people? I'm not sure. And that is correct, Mark. In the books, the whites cannot be killed by dragon glass. Only the others, the whites are killed by fire most effectively. 
So Dylan asking about House Royce says, House Royce, he thinks, used to have dragon steel armor. The maesters say their bronze armor isn't as old as they claim, and like Euron's armor, it's covered in runes. <clears throat> Makes me think of ice being a name that's passed down to different swords, but in armor form. My headcanon is that they're descended from the Winged Knight, who is a dragon rider from a shy. Uh, the Winged Knight legend definitely could be a remnant of the great empire of the Dawn Dragon Lords in Westeros. So that's actually not crazy at all. The runic armor of the Royces does make me wonder. Um, and when you say their armor isn't as old as they claim, what that means is that they've there was an original set of armor that they've reproduced over the years. As the old ones get decrepit, they make a new runic armor because that's the, that's their jam. It's their calling card. So yeah, that makes sense to me. And the runic armor, you have to wonder if that's a long night thing, if it if it protects against the others somehow. I'm not sure how, but maybe we'll see. The Valerian armor with the runes, this definitely feels like a clue. Like, okay, this is a thing. You know, this can leave you some amount of protection against the others, but I'm not sure if it's got to be the right runes or, I don't know, maybe Cold Hands knows about that. Right? He could. So let me go back to my inbox here. Thanks, guys. Uh, pouring in the questions here fast, hot and heavy, wet and hot and squishy like a mere swamp, or like the underside of a squisher's foot. Jesse Cook says, how do you like the idea that Justin Massey is going to end up meeting with Danny in the free cities when she eventually goes west? And there'll be a partnership change between the Iron Bank and Stannis because we know Bravos is ultimately going to want to support Danny. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. That is kind of interesting. <clears throat> he could get, I mean, he's in, um, he's in Bravos and Danny's going to stop through, uh, Volantis. So I don't know if they're necessarily going to run into each other. I don't know if he'll make it that far south, but Martin could have him could have that happen if he wanted to. I'll have to think about that. What do you guys think? Is is there a potential plot plotting if Justin Massey runs into Danny in the free cities? I could give Danny some information about Stannis. Because I do think Stannis is going to stick around a little longer than in the show. So Danny and Stannis could they could interact potentially. Miguel asking, there are a lot of caves in and around the wall. Could it be that the giants from the earth were the trees and moved to form the wall? Oh, like in uh, like in Lord of the Rings, right? AOT, what's AOT? I don't know what AOT is, but I thought you were talking about Ents. Um, I don't think so. I don't think that the weirwood trees are going to get up and walk. I think it's only sort of they're playing with, oh, Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan, I don't know. I don't know that one. Um, but so the giants waking in the earth is partially a reference to weirwood trees. Um, the giants are, the weirwoods are called pale giants frozen in time. And they obviously look like they want to wake. And there's that one oak tree that John sees south of the wall. The one the wildlings carved the face on. It looks angry, like it wants to tear up from its roots and come chasing after them. Um, so yeah, yeah, I don't watch anime. Sorry. I don't, I don't hate it, but I'm just really busy. I don't, I don't watch a lot of anything really. I, I mostly work. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see here. So, so the giants in the, in the earth, that's definitely a partially reference to the weirwood trees. And the caves are important because the weirwoods are an underground organism, so they need the caves. And let me see here. Yes, uh, this is how you engage with me on Instagram. At David Lightbringer on Instagram. I need to get back to posting more regularly on Instagram. I fell off the wagon <clears throat> uh, with, the, uh, with the move here recently. So Isabel says... 
I really like the theory about Tyrion being a chimera, which could also play a role in Tyrion having Ares and Tywin as a father. That's what it would mean, yeah. Let's see. I wrote you about already about it. Maybe you had some time to think about it some more. Chimerism starts with a twin pregnancy, and the stronger twin absorbs the weaker one. Thus, patches of cells or even whole organs can be genetically from a different person, resulting in two different eye colors, hair colors. It sounds like George to throw in some in-womb cannibalism. Yeah, it totally does. It totally does. <clears throat> two ways Tyrion could be Ares and Tywin's son. A, two fertile eggs were present at the same time, and one was fertilized by Tywin, the other by Ares. This can actually happen a couple of days apart. Or B, super fertilization. Although Joanna was already pregnant by one dude, a fertile egg went on its way and got fertilized by the other dude. This can happen a couple of months apart. So keep up the good work. Interesting. That's, yeah, man. I mean, George includes chimeras in the book and talks about them. And there's a lot of symbolism about one thing consuming the other. I mean, that's all about the alchemical transformation symbolism. So, yeah, I totally think that could be a thing. Random music su suggestion. Well, we talked about Krangbin earlier, but in case you didn't hear me say Budo's Band, definitely check out Budo's Band. It's like Bruce Lee music, and it's awesome. And I've seen him live a couple times, too. So thanks for that input on the chimera thing yeah i definitely think that's possible there's another sort of strange conspiratorial theory video i could make after the bolt-on david constable says once again you guys are amazing you've followed up on a similar topic asking about Tyrion. david says was always curious in the books Tyrion comes to believe that joff sent the assassin at bran in winterfell the show blames it on Peter. Don't know if I've answered it in the books after multiple reads. I do think it was Joffrey. I think the books point to Joffrey pretty conclusively in that one Tyrion chapter where he kind of figures it out. So, but correct me if I'm wrong. I is that is that pretty much nailed down or is that still unknown? Damn, somebody's bumping it out front, huh? Ah, I need some of that Herba Mate energy. Mm. <clears throat> no, I, I don't I don't know that Brienne will kill Stannis. I don't think that's where her uh plot is going, but it could happen. It won't be the climax of her plot. If it is, it'll just be a little something that she does on the way. Okay, cool. I finally caught up. So thank you for all the PayPal's guys. That was a furious rush of them. And let me see if I can go back and find the one from August 4th. Yes, from Thomas. Okay, here we go. Will Lord Snow ever become King Snow of the Others? Well, yeah, that's, that is the premise of my Lord Snow video and the promised to the Others video is that the Others need somebody that they can make into a Night King. <clears throat> somebody that they can make into a leader of the Others. Um, and I believe that the key is that this will allow them to pass the wall or perform some other magic that will bring on the long night. And uh, Jon Snow is the obvious candidate. Euron is the other potential candidate. But I definitely think Jon Snow, basically I think, just imagine the horror of it. Look at it from a story writing point of view. Everyone's debating about what to do with the wall after Jon's assassination, the wildlings and the watch and the plotters, and they're all jockeying for position. Melisandre, and then the others come and attack the wall and Jon Snow's corpse rises. Like, it's just going to be ultimate horror and terror if that happens. Blue star eyes, Lord Snow rising from the dead uh, and the others attacking. So that's like, you know, 
I just feel like that's something that's going to happen. He could, it could even last long enough for John to <clears throat> lead the white walkers on an attack in Winterfell. So he was going to attack Ramsey Bolton at Winterfell when he died. It's possible he'll wake up and do the same thing, but leading the, leading the others on an attack in Westeros and that he won't be set free of that enchantment until Winterfell. Uh, that is, I think that's possible. And no, we would not get a Jon Snow POV as an other. We wouldn't, we would see that from the outside. I don't think that would be Jon anyways. Jon is going to be in Ghost. It's just his corpse that's going to be puppeted by the others. They just need his body and his magical blood. That is what I think. And Jon's resurrection is tied to the breaking of the wall. I don't know if, how it's going to be tied, but they're going to happen at the same time. Or they'll be they'll be linked in some way. And yes, Minty Jane is my muse. Absolutely. Let's see here. And somebody was sharing. Uh, yeah, Car Snack. There's the Lord Snow video. And I do have everything organized in playlists. A great way to find my videos is just to click on the uh, playlist tabs on my channel. Okay, here's a good question. This is a popular question from Will Shepard. I saw a theory that the Shadowlands are an opposite pole to the heart of winter. If this is true, could the demons of Yi-T be an opposite to the others? Absolutely, they could be. It's kind of implied that they are. They're either others or a different kind of demon that arose based on whatever elemental magic was happening over there. Um, and yes, I do believe that, you know, that there, there is a reference to something called the heart of shadow in the heart of the Shadowlands. And I do believe the heart of winter and the heart of shadow are both hinges of the world and very much opposite poles. There are so many parallels. A shy is made of oily black stone and it's covered in darkness. The heart of winter has that curtain of bright light, the Aurora Borealis, and everything is white. Um, so it's uh, <clears throat> so it's very much opposite. Then we have Night's Queen and Melisandre, which are like parallel characters. And Night's Queen comes down from the north. Melisandre comes from a shy. The others come from the heart of winter. The dragons come from a shy. On and on and on and on. Do we have do we have nicknames flowing here in the chat? This is good. And then, yes, it's, we're told that the demons of the Lion of Night uh, invaded and ravaged the land during the long night in the east. So that does sound like an equivalent of the others. Let's see. Ethan says, might the Bloodstone Emperor slash Azor High have tried to bring Nissa Nissa back to life? Um, unaware that it would otherize her into Night's Queen who would ensorcel him and bring about the long night. So if there's anything like this, it would be like Azor High sacrifices Nissa Nissa. Maybe he really did do it with sorrow and not evil intentions, right? Maybe he thought he was doing the right thing. Then he realizes he didn't. And so he goes searching for her in the weirwood net. And so the whole Night's Queen, Night's King thing could be Azor High and Nissa Nissa finding each other in the Weirwood Net, but I don't think so. I think that Azor High did murder Nissa Nissa, and I think that if Nissa Nissa is Night's Queen, she's basically turning the tables on Azor High by trapping him in the Weirwood Net and taking his power. But uh, that's certainly open for speculation. I mean, I'm just speculating there, so. All right, let me go ahead and pull Cleo out. She's been pretty good so far, uh, but she's ready to come out. So one second, I'll give you some artwork to look at. I was talking about the undying earlier. So let me pull up the undying artwork. I 
probably will change the cover to the heart of winter. Since we talked about that at the beginning. Cool. So I've got a bunch of undying pictures here, but I will share one in particular while I go and get Cleo. And this one is by Travis Kohler. And you can see Drogon roasting the heart. So it's definitely a nice one. Be right back, Sid. Just one second. All right, let me just get Cleo set up here. <laughs> A little window into my life. Here you go, good girl. Here you go. Go ahead, sit down. Homemade rolling tree purchase is a must. Yeah. We'll see if she's happy with that or if she needs to be on my shoulder. We shall see. Oh, God, I left the naughty drawer open. Oh, she's going to freak out. Jesus. What was I thinking? Both birds want to build a nest in that drawer, and when it's open, they freak out. All right. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yes, I do specialize in uh, exotic track pants. Thank you for noticing. Uh, thank you for noticing. All right. Do you think the land of always winter? is connected to Essos. And that's why there's the five forts to defend from the whites. Well, even if they're not connected, we know there are some kind of demons and monsters out there in the waste. So it's, uh, yes, oh my God, the naughty drawer, exactly. Um, uh, Goose is the worst of the naughty drawer. But yes, even whether or not they're connected, uh, we just said that during the long night in the east, the... Uh, the uh, there were demons that invaded the demons of the Lion of Night. So whether or not those are the others or some different kind of demons, the five forts presumably function similarly to the wall. Now, the important thing here is that the five forts are made by made with fused stone by the Great Empire of the Dawn. So this, first of all, proves that the Great Empire of the Dawn were dragon lords because that's the only way you make fused stone. But it also obviously such a strong parallel to the wall, right? Uh, so the idea of something that's similar to the wall being made out of fused stone is intriguing because there are theories that there is a stone wall underneath the ice, either oily black stone or fused stone. Now, if the Great Empire of the Dawn came to Westeros and the last hero has a connection to Azor High and Dawn and stuff like that. One of the big secrets that's being hidden here is that dragons were used during the first long night to fight the others. We're told of the last hero having dragon steel, and we're told about the, the watch defeating the others 
but we're not told about dragons being involved. I believe dragons were involved. And that is a big secret, essentially. That's one of the things, that's one of the points of the whole great empire of the dawn theory. So the idea that there could be a fused stone wall underneath the ice would make sense because then the then the wall has both ice and fire, right? It, it, that's now it makes sense that it stops the others, but also could stop the dragons. Because remember, Alisan's dragon doesn't want to fly over the wall. We don't know if it can or if it just didn't want to. But it would kind of make sense if there was, you know, dragon stone underneath of magical ice, then you've got ice and fire together. So very possible that the five forts are giving us a hint about fused stone or just, you know, dragon power being used at the wall in Westeros. Or maybe it's just a parallel. The wall's made of ice, and so the five forts are made of, you know, fire rock. And that's just, it's just symmetry. Yeah, the exact opposite of oily black stones would be watery frozen white stones, blocks of ice, exactly. Exactly. I don't know how you would fight the army of the dead without dragons. You can kill the whites. I mean, the others actually aren't that bad. This is something that, that you you figure out once you think about it. Like, the others aren't that hard to kill. There's not many of them, and all you need is Valerian steel or dragon glass. And this explains why the others don't show themselves quickly to Waymar and the Night's Watch. It's why one of them fights and the others stand back. They look at his sword real carefully, and once they see him bleed, their whole attitude changes, and they're like, ah, screw this guy. He can bleed. He's mortal. I don't got to be afraid of him. So it seems like the others are watching out for certain things. They know they're vulnerable to fire whites, and they know they're vulnerable to fire weapons and dragons and things. So... The others aren't really that hard to kill if you have the right weapons. However, hundreds and thousands of whites are a big fucking problem <laughs> because you send people out to fight them and everyone who dies rises in their army. So inevitably they get the upper hand and just run you over. The whites would be incredibly hard to stop. Um, and that is the real terror of the others. And so the whites... Yeah, without dragons, I don't know how you would fight the whites. Um, and that, that would be the main purpose of the dragons. So we'll see. Yeah, maybe, maybe the five forts were covered in ice at one point, but they seem too far south, I think. Let me just pop back over here. I'm going back now through my older PayPals to see if there's any other ones that I may have missed with good questions. Ludmila with a thank you. Andre, general appreciation. Oh, then there was this legendary one from Justin that we tackled about the floating hearts. I talked about the, I'll, I'll revisit this since I mentioned the floating heart of the undying. He was saying that the floating heart is like a whole thing, that there that there, it's a form of magic in this and that there are more hearts. Um, like the fiery heart of R'hllor, what's that about? R'hllor isn't even personified as a deity, he's just this abstract name given to fire, basically. But they have a symbol of this burning heart. So maybe in the red temple, there's a floating red heart of fire, just like the blue shadow heart in the House of the Undying. Uh, and then there's the heart of winter. So this person is speculating, uh, and it was again Justin, that these magical hearts are like a source of power at, at more than one place and not just the Undying. Um, which is a cool theory. I mean, if if uh, I particularly like the idea that at, at you know that the Reloris might have a floating fiery heart somewhere, just like the Undying do, that would totally make sense to me. And as I'm going to talk about in uh, a video I'm going to make in like two months about Melisandre's secrets about the Shadowbinders and the Reloris, I think the Reloris do have a way of turning into fire others, a fiery version of an other. 
and that that's actually what Melisandre is doing. So it's kind of parallel to the undying gradually turning themselves into shadows. Come here, good. Yeah. Hi. I knew you'd want to come hang out with me. Where do you want to go? That's the question. Want to be on my knee? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Do I think there are ice dragons? Some say they're at the Shivering Sea. I tend to think so. I don't know if we'll see one, but I tend to think so. They wouldn't be any more fantastical than the others. It would just be an other in a different form, an other shaped like a dragon, and I don't see why there wouldn't be. So I also think that George really likes the idea of the ice dragon. If you read the short story, The Ice Dragon, he clearly romanticizes the idea and... I just think he loves the concept. So I think we'll get we'll we'll see something about an ice dragon. Again, highly recommend the ice dragon short story. I did a whole stream where I discussed the ice dragon as well as potential implications that it has for the end of a song of ice and fire. That was a really good stream. So check that one out. All my streams are really good, right? <laughs> now the ice dragon was a particularly good one. Yes, and please do make like Bobby Baratheon and stove in the chest of the dragon. Uh, the like button, sorry. The demon of the trident, Robert Baratheon. Yeah, Bobby hasn't made an appearance on my channel in a hot minute, has he? Yes, you've kept me down here locked in the crypts forever. I haven't been able to come on the YouTube channel like I wanted to. I keep asking you and you just give me wrong directions and send me back down further into the crypts. It's very annoying. I just channeled some Bobby B for you. There you go. <laughs> Where is uh, what? Yeah, old new dude is full of uh, good ideas. What did he say this time? It's my man. Old new dude has two more weeks of treatments for his heart. So we wish you a fiery heart, old new dude. <clears throat> a fiery heart of lore. Um, yes, hello. We've accidentally replaced your heart with a baked potato. You have 10 seconds to live. South Park reference. That was always a good one. Oh, Kenny. <laughs> Bobby B so far down the crypts, hiding from old nanny's about to come up in Blood Raven's cave. Yes, I know there's a connection down here somewhere. I was told there was. Ned said there was an old a tunnel somewhere. I wonder if it leads to a whorehouse like the tunnel in King's Landing. Yes, the one that Tywin built. I knew about that tunnel. I used it all the time. Go down to Shatias. Oh, yes. Very familiar. There's the symbolism of the other's ice dragon. Thank you, Carl Karsnark. Yeah, I've got I've got Bobby on a leash, man. I could summon him whenever. You just let me know. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with Bobby, like a like a channel, like a medium. See, Bobby lives down in the crypts. He's actually dead. That's the thing. He died on the trident, or not on the trident, but he, you know, he died uh, in the in the in the what's the woods near King's Landing? He's dead. Is the point? He doesn't realize he's dead. He thinks he's alive. So he thinks he's hiding in the crypts. He, he's dead. He's, he's just wandering the crypts as a spirit. So that's why I can channel him whenever I want to. It's, yeah. Don't tell Bobby, though. I would ruin it for him. Maybe he wouldn't care. I don't know. I give him the wine. He just drinks the wine. He doesn't notice that it like just goes right through. But whatever. It's, it works. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, oh, more PayPal's. Thank you. Let's see what we got here. Couple of freshies. Uh, and the first one is from Matthew. Tinfoil theory here. I know that World of Ice and Fire shows the map of the Far East and shows the five forts but based on some of the anomalous buildings around the world, such as Battle Isle, Moat, Kalen, and others, 
I've always thought that the five forts were related to these structures as opposed to that shown as opposed to that uh i'm not okay hang on a second so i really don't think the westeros essos connection is a thing guys um if there is uh a connection it's you have to go through the north pole to get there so it's only a connection the others could use it would be like can the others come down from the heart of winter to different parts of the globe like if you're at the north pole you know if the ice caps are a little bigger you could walk to either russia or canada right um you can't quite but almost um so that's kind of what we're talking about it's not something that humans could use I i'm pretty sure and it's not important like we don't the important fight against the others is in the east that is, I mean, not in the East, in the West, in Westeros. So we we shouldn't, we don't need to think about the Night's Watch going to Essos and stuff like that. I, I don't think, I don't think that's the point. I think the whole point is of the Eastern stuff is to show us that the Dragon Lords come from Ashai and that they came to Westeros. And that's why all the Azor High stuff connects with Westeros. Um, that's basically the whole deal. Grant. <clears throat> wants to pipe up and say that Arya is Cersei's Valonqar. Uh, it's Jamie. It's definitely Jamie. But thank you, Grant. <clears throat> I'd be shocked if it wasn't Jamie. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, and then... Now, it could be that... Uh, so when they say... Um, let's see. What was I going to say? Lost my train of thought. Okay. So when they say that the Knights King was the 13th Lord Commander of the Watch, and I'm saying that the Knights King is Azor Ahai and that he's the one who created the others, there's a timeline conflict there, right? Um, it could be that he's the 13th Lord Commander because the Knights Watch was made from a previous elite fighting guard such as the king's guard and that there were 12 commanders before them something like that so perhaps the origins of the night's watch goes back to the five forts and that they came to westeros during the long night azor high events and became the night's watch and that there is a connection that way that's that's as probably close as i could come for that Cleo's being very good. You can just see the top of her head here at the bottom of the thing. She's just preening herself very peacefully on my knee. Good job, Cleo. Septa Lamour is actually Lamour Reigns. Like House Rain. Tywin missed one. That would be cool. That would also be interesting that she was rubbing up against Tyrion. Ooh, I made a double entendre. Uh, because obviously Tyrion's a Lannister. That could be interesting. I like the theory that she's Wenda the White Fawn. I forget whose theory that is. Is Blood Raven's cave connected to the Winterfell crypts? Yes. I think potentially all those weirwood caves could be connected, or any of them could be. And that underground river in blood raven's cave is especially suggestive uh was brainstorming with quinn on our winds of winter series one of the ones i think was one about bran and we were pointing out that uh um cody okay cody i'll, I'll get you in a second buddy just thank just uh you know chill out there um so blood raven's cave i think that mira there's a good chance that mira reed will end up using her Cranogman skills and making a boat that her and Bran can take down the stream to escape from Blood Raven's cave. Because what we saw on the book on the show made no sense. Mira hauling Bran in a sled through the woods, like the entire distance that cold hands and the elk carried them up there. That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> but that underground river would make a great escape route if it goes somewhere and uh 
like I said, Mira Reed could make a boat out of like dried weirwood roots or something or or strips of bark that they gather from outside. So she could definitely make a boat and they can they can uh, escape that way. So I, I want to see this happen. I like the theory very much. It makes sense for Mira to be there. Her skills would come into play. And George, I think George wants to go. He wants to do these fantasy tropes like the underground river and the underground caves. Like if you think of uh, the silver chair, Chronicles of Narnia, the silver chair. I think we could see something like that completely. And, uh, oh, Tranquil, did I miss your super chat? Let me scroll back up. I see one from Georgia and devoted to Mariah. Oh, I need to pay better attention. Coming in quick. But if I missed your super chat, repeat it now and the mods will help me get it. So let's get these last two. Devoted to Mariah says, what kind of magic could Blood Raven Bran... Um, could Blood Raven or Bran use to guide John back into his body? <clears throat> so if you think about Bran, Bran appeared to John in a dream as a weird tree with Bran's face, and he reached out and he sort of booped John on the forehead, and this catapulted John into the wolf dream. So Bran already has touched John in a dream and sent him into his wolf. So very easily... He might touch John in a dream and send him out of his wolf, right? Uh, this this could this could be work as foreshadowing for that. <clears throat> I also think Bran could be involved in probably Melisandre will be the one to drive the other white power from John's corpse, but Bran could be involved in that too. Um, it could be also, you know how George always likes to center the heart in conflict, right? Well, what if John, in order to get unstuck from either ghost's body or wherever like dream realm that he's floating maybe he needs to come to terms with stuff and accept certain truths so maybe bran contacts him and tells him about rlj who he really is you know because john's identity is a central thing that he's going to have to unpack so it could be that bran helps him emotionally by contacting him giving him knowledge being a familiar face like Bran is somebody that John loves dearly. So there's a few ways that Bran could help guide John back. Great question devoted to Mariah. Georgia Downey. Do you think Georgia? Good Lord. Do you think if there are ice dragons, there were dragons from the empire of the dawn turned by the others? Oh yes, that could be. That absolutely could be. That's just as likely as dragons having been there in the first place. Everything that's going to happen at the end could have happened already and had been foreshadowed. For show. Sure. Come here, girl. I want you to chill on my shoulder. Hi, good girl. Hi, good girl. Can you give me a kiss? Can you give me a kiss? Oh, good girl. Show your pretty pink wings for the people, girl. Oh, good girl. Okay, here. You don't want to be on my shoulder, huh? Okay. All right. Usually that's the best spot to be on my shoulder, but that's uh, not today. Let's see if that super chat got repeated, the one that I missed. Vortex, Vortex, Nissa, Nissa. Do you think someone is imprisoned in the crypts of Winterfell? Uh, yes, could be. Could be Night's Queen down there, actually. Um, could be... I think there is a Weirwood throne down there. So, like, will we see somebody's old skeleton on the Weirwood throne? That could be... The oldest levels of the crypts, I wonder if maybe the buried Starks were actually buried in sepulchers that were connected to Weirwood Roots, so the Weirwood Roots could... Well, basically, they would have been buried in Weirwood Thrones like the dead singers in Blood Raven's Cave. We could see something like that down there. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's what I think. I think we will see Weirwood action. Weirwood Throne, Starks on Weirwood Thrones, bones wrapped in Weirwood, stuff like that. 
and all the symbolism about Leanna being down there could actually imply Knight's Queen being down there. Yes, that is what I was trying to get to. Um, the Hammer of the Waters, I really think is just a fallout from the Moon Meteor. I don't think the Hammer of the Waters, the Arm of Dorne wasn't broken intentionally. That is, that's why George hangs a lantern on the idea that that doesn't make sense. That's one of those funny folkloric explanations that have cropped up over the centuries, but it's not really true. I'm pretty damn sure that was a moon meteor. And so you have to go back to the, um, the story of the calling down of the hammer of the water speaks of the sacrifice of children of the forest on the Isle of faces. Well, I think that Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest. And I think that Azor High probably did sacrifice her on the Isle of Faces, not in a shy. And that, and so essentially the Hammer of the Waters myth is almost right. It was blood magic sacrifice on the Isle of Faces that called it down. But that was Azor and Nissa Nissa, and the Hammer was a moon meteor. And even if they weren't on the Isle of Faces, Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest, and she was sacrificed to break the moon and thus call down the ha the hammer. Oh, it's a good one from Smitty. Do you think the humanoid species of Westeros descend from a common ancestor? Yeah, I tend to think so. I think all the giants and the humans and the children of the forest do they did they are they they are like evolutionary branches. I think all the humanoids have to be. And we also have the question of magical interbreeding. You know, it's pretty certain that squishers exist and that they interbred with humans and the humans interbred with the children of the forest. So I think George is imagining a situation where we had like, you know, Neanderthals and Denisovians and archaic man all sort of mixing their genes together, but also sharing an older common ancestor. That, that's what I would I would guess. You got those brindled men and the hairy men. All kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Let's see here. I'm looking for that super chat that I may have missed. Let's see if it got repeated. There are my, there are dinosaurs on Planetos. Yes, there are raptors in Sothorios lizards with scythe claws they're they're pretty obviously raptors so that is that is in uh that is in us authorios somebody did make a video about that i forget who it was westeros anthropology video is that it i can't remember yes other people saw a video about it too cool so if anyone can, can dig up the link then we can one of the mods can share it Uh, Dylan with another one. Oh, thanks, Dylan. Do you have any tips for theory crafting? I have an idea that keeps getting bigger the more I think about it, and I'd like to solidify it somehow. Okay, well. Sure. What you want to think about is what is the most important mystery? Because what George will do is he'll create parallels to the central mystery. Like, you could start off wondering what the Bolton symbolism and the flayed man is all about. But once you see the connection to the weirwoods, like I did the other day, you realize, oh, well, the weirwoods are the important mystery. The Boltons, whatever they're doing is going to be something that parallels the weirwood mystery and gives us clues about the weirwood mystery. So even if you're just trying to solve like the Bolton family history, you should look for it to work in parallel to the already established ideas about the Weirwoods once you discover that connection. So <clears throat> I feel like that helps a lot is to determine what things are mimicking, you know, because the long night is the important mystery. All the stuff having to do with the long night and the war for the dawn is always the important stuff and everything else sort of works in service to that. So that's what I would say. And Sometimes you do have to kill your darlings. You can't follow every little rabbit hole 
that's why I frequently cut things up and make little separate essays and stuff. So you may have to figure out what is your central idea. And as you find yourself straying too far from that, just chop those off into tertiary explorations to be completed later. That will help you from going in too many directions at once. Forrest Galante said that if dragons did exist on the planet, their bones and skin wouldn't fossilize. Well, the bones don't seem to, um, but the skin does seem to gradually disintegrate because we've we've we found that dragon skeleton in the in the red waste, and it's just bones. So the rest of it's apparently decayed. Or burnt away. How much of a side character do we think Lady Stoneheart is? Because I don't think she's a minor character. Well, Catelyn's, Catelyn was an important character. Stoneheart has an in, a finite shelf life. So I, I'm not sure what you mean by minor or important. I mean, she's definitely going to do some important stuff. And I think she's going to hang around for a little longer. But I don't think she'll like be alive at the end or anything. I don't think she's going to see Jon Snow. I think the longest that she'll live is for Arya to come back to Westeros and give her the final gift of mercy. Oh, here's the link to that anthropology video from Carl Karsnark. Anthropology of Westeros from Trey the Explainer. Oh yeah, Trey the Explainer. Yeah, he's got a good channel. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's just goose. That's just goose, girl. Here, come here. Come here, girl. Come here. All right. Oh, devoted to Mariah says that sort of thinking can help you in science as well. Yeah, because it's similar. You're operating in a realm of the theoretical. So you have to sort of stay on target, but then just put a pin in things, the little side branches as you go. And there's a PayPal from Andrew. Just love the mythical astronomy analysis. Keep it up would like more content on the lands beyond a shy. Yes, yeah, so would we all. There's not much. But there is some cool Carcosa artwork from one of my favorite artists. So let's show off the work of Enrique Merguia, who's done Carcosa. But I'll show you all of his stuff. <clears throat> He did five forts, Yin, Carcosa, Ashai, and Stygi. Some of our favorite places. So check this out. You've seen most of this art. I've definitely used it all in my videos, but let's go there once again. So first we have five forts. I love this, the angle on this one. Because you can sort of zoom in on the picture and gradually rotate it and feel just like you're one of these crows flying over the five forts. So you can see the wall in between the forts and you can see them strung out in between sort of a mountain pass. So pretty good stuff there. I'll even zoom in a bit on it. It's got a lot of detail. So you can see that the cities. You know, he drew he drew these monstrous alien looking cities here. Pretty cool stuff. Put some thought into it. And you can see, yeah, you can see the wall sort of going up into the mountains and the other forts. So there we go. Pretty cool stuff. Very cool, actually. 
here's Yeen, a city older than time. Yeen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeen is hella cool. And uh, <clears throat> you can see what I like about this is he's really got uh, the megaliths. You can see how big they are. So you can see the size of the people. And then you can see these oily black stone blocks the size of a cottage. And Mo Kalen is built out of blocks the same size. So you can see a bunch of them laying around. And there's Yin going up into the hills. It's big and terrifying. So really cool detail work there. More oily black stone down below. And a horrified onlooker. Oh my God. Turn back, wayward traveler. So this is this is Carcosa. This is one of the places beyond the five forts. And if we zoom in, we can see there's some sort of cult leader, the yellow emperor giving a sermon. And down here are the terrified or terrifying worshipers preaching the good word of the lion of night, no doubt. Incense sconces in the rafters, the chains. Even their chains are scary looking. Pretty cool. So that's Carcosa from Enrique Merguia. All these are Enrique Merguia. Here is a shy. You guys recognize this one. I use this one all the friggin' time. Got the gray sunlight. Got the eye, eye symbols on the temple. And then, of course, the temple of the Lion of Night. And you can see the people going in. Again, the detail that, that Enrique puts in is just great. So the oily black stone temple. You can see it's a couple of red priests running around on the way to Starry Wisdom Church or Lion of Night Church or whatever it is. And there is, of course, a couple of masked shadow binders. You can see they're wearing masks. See, you can tell the red lacquered mask, just like Quave. And there's another masked shadow binder. So that is a shy. I love all this, how it goes back up there, up the hills. And then the last one is Stygi, the corpse city at the heart of the shadow. And you can see these are, <clears throat> let me zoom in. You can really, it, is, it took me a while to notice how much detail there was in this one. But yeah, it goes all the way back into this valley of very little sunlight. And some sort of, perhaps these are the gemstone emperors. These statues here. Looking over the land, it's very scary, very terrifying. And this fellow is going to show you the way. He's going to tell Marwin where the books are. And there are some red priests or shadow binders, perhaps. So, thank you, Enrique Merguia, for all that great art. And then we got a super chat from Adam Wolford. So for the sword that John will need to end the long night, would it be the sword of the dawn? But for John to stop the others, it would be the sword that was there when he was born. <clears throat> yeah, if he gets dawn, yes, dawn was present at John's birth. This to me is a big foreshadowing that John will wield dawn. Um, I think there's many foreshadowings for it. Check out my videos called Dawn is the Original Ice. There's two videos. Part one is called... Um, the last hero, and the second one is the pale sword. I do think uh, I think Lon Claw will end up back in Jorah's hands, and I think Jorah will be on the last sort of Night's Watch crew, and I think that John will wield Dawn. I think that Daenerys will give Dawn to John after getting it from Fagon and Darkstar. That is what I have predicted. Guys, give me a quick second. I need to see if I can um, get to my other 
I think I have more cough drops. I totally need one right now. One second. Let me throw up some uh, some artwork for you real quick. And then I'll come back and ah, forget it. I'll just hang on. I'll come back and answer this question. Oh, well. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. So, Adam Wolford. So, for this, okay. Uh, oh, I pretty much answered that. Yeah. All right. So, I do think John Wheeled Dawn. And, uh, like I said, check out the uh, Dawn is the original ice. I do believe that the first last hero wielded Dawn. Um, and this honestly, like, uh, is pretty easy to figure out. Um, if Dawn was Lightbringer, then it certainly was the sword of dragon steel that the last hero wielded. And it's easy to see how that would work. Any sword made from a meteor would be dragon steel. And Azor High comes from a dragon lord empire, which means that his Lightbringer that was forged in these sacred fires, uh, <laughs> You know, those could have been the sacred fires of a dragon. So there's many ways in which Dawn could be Lightbringer. And the last hero's dragon steel sword has to be either Dawn or Lightbringer or both. And the last hero very likely was a Stark. So then you have a Stark wielding Dawn. And this is where the naming tradition of naming their swords ice would have come from because Dawn is a big white sword, it looks like a sword made of ice. But it's like the coldest ice around because it can like kill the kill the others or whatever. And so if the if a Stark last hero wielded Dawn, then all the Starks afterwards maybe named their swords in memory of the big white sword that saved the day. And so they call all their swords ice. So Dawn would have been the original ice of House Stark. And then for some reason they gave it to the Danes for safekeeping. They took it down to Starfall, perhaps because. Dawn might have Dawn might have properties that uh, the others could use potentially. Um, it's a it's an open question. Like, how different is it than Valerian steel? Is it just the color, or does it have different properties? You know, um, could it function as a glass candle? Is that description of it being pale as milk glass imply that it could be like a glass candle? And I saw someone else ask. Can Valerian steel swords be used as glass candles? Probably not. Or else, what's the point of having obsidian candles if you could use the swords that way? But maybe. Let's see here. So mods, how am I doing with the super chats? Have I missed any? Is there any that have slipped by me, or am I am I pretty much on top of things? Um. Uh. So my next, 
Someone was asking what my next video is going to be. My next produced video is going to be that five-part Nightbringer series. I, I talked about that earlier in the stream. If you didn't see it, um, you catch it on the rewatch. It's going to be the updated Moon Meteor Theory. After that, it's going to be Melisandre's Secrets, which is going to be my deep exploration of Shadowbinders and Relorism and how they both have secrets about the Long Night. Uh, so, Slick Will, did I miss yours? What was it? Let's go back. The clever thing to do, guys, is if you... um. You should say that I missed your super chat and then repeat the question so that if I see the comment that says you missed it, I will then have the question right there to uh, to, to address. Um, Josh Blackburn says, if Gregor Clegane did come back into the picture, what do you think the rest of his story would look like? Um, okay. If Gregor Clegane did come back into the... Well, I mean, we... Well, he Sir Robert Strong is in the picture, uh, but Gregor's dead. You know, he's he dead. He got that poison from Ober and Spear, and he dead. Uh, but Robert Strong is definitely like curious to see where that plot line is going. Um, who do you think is going to fight Robert Strong in the in Cersei's trial by combat? Is it going to be one of the uh, one of the Faith? It's definitely not going to be Lancel. So not sure what's going there. I I'm I'm was disappointed that they didn't do much with Robert Strong on the show. I'm I'm thinking George is going to use that for something more horrible. Josh, Slick will repeat your question, buddy, and I'll get it. The question was. Do you think that it means anything? The old one Crescent tries to poison Mel. Um, oh, Crescent tries to poison Mel. Similar thing is probably Rob and Danny. I don't. Um. I'm going to need a longer explanation on the question. I just, I'm not sure what the question is here. So if whoever asked it originally can expand. Oh, here's Slick Willies. The Onyx Emperor got his name uh, by starting the Manning of the Five Forts, a.k.a. the Night's Watch. Probably not. That would be too far back, right? Um, that's several emperors back. I mean, maybe. Um, I've often wondered if the Tourmaline Brotherhood in Karth unearthed the, like, the sayings of the tourmaline emperor and they follow the wisdom of the tourmaline emperor. And that's why they're the tourmaline brotherhood. Cause I do think Karth retains a pretty strong link to the great empire of the dawn. Um, so perhaps the Onyx emperor has something to do with the black stone and the night's watch. But I would guess that that was something that would be more recent, but all that's so speculative. I mean, this is just George sort of creating the illusion of depth there. It sort of runs out at a certain point. Mm -mm -mm. yeah cleo is behaving admirably today this is really this is working out super good um yeah praise the lord <laughs> it was a rough week there last week she's not on edibles i did feed her a bunch of brown rice though and rice makes the birds kind of sleepy and sedate i forgot i used to do that Mm. Mm, 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 mm. I think he gets his name from both the stone and the symbol of Onyx, uh, a ward from evil. Ah, one of the first things to mess with the Empire was beasts. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't thinking about the magical properties of the stones. Tourmaline is also a big ward against evil as well. Interestingly. Professor Gonzo, you just got an email from the FBI. That's not good. What have you been up to, man? 
So Vortex Vortex is talking about Lightbringer and Dawn. Could one of the swords be down in the crypts? Well, Dawn's not in the crypts, but it is possible that there are two Lightbringer swords. One is Dawn, the white sword, and the other one would be the first black sword. And this would be made from the Bloodstone Emperor's black meteor that he worshipped. It would be in parallel to Dawn being made from the white meteor, right? Um, I think this is very possible because you need two swords to make a good sword fight. And I think, Az I don't think Dawn could be light, the one that Azor Ahai stabbed Nissa Nissa with because uh, I think that using blood magic to make swords is kind of the template for Valyrian steel. And so I think the black swords kind of imply that that uh that uh blood sacrifice element and i think dawn might be different so i suspect that bloodstone emperor slash azor high's lightbringer was a black sword and that dawn is an older sword from the great empire of the dawn before the bloodstone emperor's corruption that's why we see the gemstone emperors that danny sees in her vision they're all holding swords of pale fire dawn is made from a pale stone it's a pale sword, pale as milk glass. If it were to take fire, you could imagine it with white fire or pale red or blue fire. So these swords of pale fire that the Great Empire of the Dawn Emperors hold, to me, is always suggested that Dawn is the original technology, that the black swords are almost like um, a corrupted version, like a fallen version, right, <clears throat> of Dawn. And so... To me, it's like Dawn is the one original Great Empire sword that somebody saved and that the hero used to fight against Azor Ahai, Night's King, who might have had a black sword. So, you know, if you think about it, Ned Stark, we, we start off in the north looking at the Starks and everything is winter, winter, winter. But Ned has this dragon forged sword and Kat's talking about Valyria and all this stuff. So why does the Warden of the North have this black Valyrian steel sword? Then you go as far south as you can get, and you find these people that look like Valyrians, the Danes. And instead of having a black sword, they have a white sword that looks like the bone, the shin bone of an other. Well, seriously, both the bones of the others and Dawn, if you haven't heard, are both compared to, to being as pale as milk glass. And there's other connections as well. <clears throat> the swords that the others hold are alive with light. They don't look exactly like Dawn. They're pale crystal instead of white, but they're alive with moonlight, just like Dawn is alive with light. And so down in the South, you have these Valerian looking people with this sword that looks like an, a stick of ice. And then up in the North, you have the Lord of the, no you know, Lord of winter, King of winter, and he's got a black dragon sword. So it seems like there's a switch O change O kind of thing. Then at the Tower of Joy, Ned and Arthur Dane fought. And it's it's unlikely that Ned was fighting with ice because ice is such a big sword. And I think Ned said that he wasn't. I mean, uh, George said that he wasn't. But nevertheless, the owners of ice and Dawn fought and killed each other. And then Ned brought ice. I'm sorry. He brought Dawn back down to Starfall. <clears throat> so if you think about historical parallels, Imagine Ned as a... So the Tower of Joy fight is a last hero versus the others fight. Ned is the last hero. His gray wraiths are Night's Watchmen. And he's fighting against the Kingsguard, who symbolize others with their snowy white armor. So then he defeats the others, steals their baby, which he takes back to Winterfell and raises as a Stark, as his own son, which is just the last hero taking a baby that was supposed to be turned into an other from the others and raising it as a Stark, which is how the Starks get the blood of the other. So after Ned, the last hero does this and defeats the symbolic others, he then takes this icy sword, Dawn, icy looking sword down to Starfall and leaves it there. So maybe this is what happened the first time. The last hero used Dawn, which again comes from the great empire of the Dawn. So it belongs to house Dane in the first place, but somehow the potentially Stark last hero gets Dawn, uses it to save the day, and then brings it back down to Starfall, just like Ned did. So 
<clears throat> I strongly suspect we'll find out that Ned finished off Arthur with Dawn somehow. Maybe Howland Reed got him with a blow dart, and then Ned sort of executed him slash gave him the gift of mercy with Dawn. I suspect that is what we will see. So that just as Ned was executed with his own sword, Ice, Arthur Dane would have been executed with his own sword. <clears throat> Dawn, excuse me. <clears throat> Gregory says, oh, no, that was one I already read. Sorry. Took me all the way back to the beginning. How you doing back there, girl? You doing okay? Good girl. Alton says, I found a lot of parallels between Nettles and Bonnie Nettles of Heaven's Gate. Both are known to have founded cults. Bonnie with Heaven's Gate and Nettles with the Burned Men. Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> Heaven's Gate followers were referred to as sheep, like the sheep that Nettles fed her dragon. Oh my God, this is great. Speaking of dragons, Haley's Comet... Okay, hold on. Oh, Haley's Comet was the focal point of Heaven's Gate beliefs. Right, I remember that. Those followers ultimately committed mass suicide to get that comet to get to the comet, which is, of course, a symbol of a dragon. Bonnie Nettles lost an eye. And Timmet, son of Timmet, a burned man, is also missing an eye. It's also worth noting that both cults believe that giving up your physical form to your higher power was important. Bonnie Nettles was also told by a fortune teller that she would meet a white-haired, fair-skinned man who would change her life forever. This man was the co-founder of Heaven's Gate, a man by the name of Applewhite. <clears throat> Nettles had Damon. Um, Damon and Applewhite both grow radical after losing their, net their nettles. That is... <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. Wow. <clears throat> that sounds like, well, first of all, that's something that George would do. This is the kind of thing that George does. And, oh my God, Quinn's going to love this. I think this makes a lot of sense. Bonnie Nettles. Wow. Heaven's Gate. It makes sense. And because they worship the comet. Totally. It totally makes sense. That is, that's fucked up, dude. That is fucked. What do you guys think, chat? What do you think about this? Wow. That's, that's wild. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to get some comments on that one on the video. Yes, sir. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, when and where will the mass suicide come in? Yeah, uh, I can tell you that. It's possible that the original green zombies uh, elected to be sacrificed to the weirwoods so that they could be made into cold hands style ultimate warrior zombies. Uh, so this would have been the ritual suicide. And that would have happened during the long night. So Vortex, Vortex saying, they say Dawn was forged from a fallen star. There could be more steel from it. So maybe the original ice was the twin of Dawn. Well, there is a question of, were there really different color meteorites? Like it says the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped a black stone that fell from the sky. Dawn is made from a pale stone. That, those could be assumptions made based on the swords that were made, you know. So they could assume that it was a white meteor because it, a white sword was produced. But meteors usually look dark. But once you refine the steel, it comes out bright, shiny steel. Um, so <clears throat> I think that... Uh, I think it's... I think it's... There may, you know... 
They may not be different meteors. They may not be different color meteors at all. I have no idea. We'll probably never find out. Yeah, that Heaven's Gate thing is still blowing my mind, man. Um, you know, George, the Colts are the, exactly the kind of thing that George would be interested in. And that's the kind of history that he would memorialize in the books. That 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 makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm inclined to think that is correct. Cool. So, yeah, the chat's been lively. Guys, if you just tend to watch and listen to these live streams, you're missing out. You can watch, you can check out the chat on the replay, even if you're not there live. And uh, there's definitely a whole different component to the entertainment going on in the chat. Oh, here's a good one from Mike Hall asking about one of my favorite things. <clears throat> Um, see, the Iron Islands had two kings, including the Driftwood King with Driftwood crowns. The Valerians have a Driftwood throne and made a pact with the Merlin King. Was the real pact with the Ironborn? So I think that what is going on is that the story that George tells us about House Valerian is giving us clues about the ancient Ironborn. So the Valerians have a driftwood throne and they made a pact with the Merlin King. The Ironborn have a driftwood crown, right? And the thing is that the Grey King, he sat on a throne made of Naga's teeth. And Naga was really, those Naga's ribs, are those are weirwood trees. So that implies that the Grey King actually sat on a weirwood throne which sounds a lot like a driftwood throne. And of course, since we know about the whole green sea or green sea symbolism, the idea of driftwood is wood that comes from the sea. So it's really just another way of telling us about a weirwood throne, which comes from the green sea, that the green seers swim in. I always spell it out in case I imagine there's new viewers that have never heard the green sea symbolism, but yeah, it's a whole thing. So Gray King is a green seer. That's the central mystery here that George is hiding. So when we go over to the Valerians, we find these dragon people. The Valerians are dragon-blooded people who made a pact with aquatic people and then came to set, sit on a wooden throne, which gave them kingship and power. So the original story is, again, Azor High. The Gray King mythology is all about Azor High. Azor High, a dragon person, making a pact with probably not the Merlin King, but rather the lords of the Green Sea, meaning the, the children of the forest, the green men, <clears throat> perhaps even Garth the Green himself, if there was a king of the green men, and then gaining the Weirwood throne, essentially. That's what we're talking about here. So the, um, the uh, Valerians are basically something to help you decode the Grey King stuff, which again is about Azor High and the Weirwood Net. As I first said, like five years ago. Cool guys, well we're at an hour and 48 minutes, so I will take last call for questions now. You guys have been great. Tons of awesome questions today, haven't they, girl? Have they been so good? Haven't the questions been good? They've been so good. Yeah. Is it a touchdown? It's a touchdown. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. Good girl. Okay. Settle down. Why is Danny the only dragon rider in Targaryen history to have this mother-child relationship with her dragons? Is it merely because of her being allegedly barren or some other symbol? Um, 
<clears throat> well, we don't get first person perspective on any of the other dragon riders. We only get the outside perspective of the maesters from the like fire and blood and stuff. So it's hard to say. I mean, they put the dragon eggs in the cradles with the kids. So that implies the dragons as children. Um, but Danny did specifically, yes, as you point out, give up her child her child in a sort of magical payment to wake the dragon. So of course, George is using that symbolism to parallel the idea of the moon as the mother of the meteor dragons. So that's a very important symbolic parallel. But we don't really get a close view on any other dragon riders, so it's hard to say. <laughs> a request, and Slick Willie is requesting a super chat proceeds be used to buy the bird a train set to ride around. <laughs> Goose maybe could fit on a train, but he would just destroy it. It, it. Yeah. They would just be destroyed. Other people outside? Yes, there are people outside. And I think I did get, uh, oh, Slick Willie, is there one more that I didn't get from you? You're giving me a few here. Let's see. <laughs> Glee is the one. Yeah. Cleo does think she's my lover. She's not. She's my pet. Um, I'm not seeing... Uh, yeah, if, I, if I missed anybody's questions, just repeat them again so I don't got to scroll back and create a bunch of dead airtime. When will we see rating, reading Rhaegar again? When I do a character stream, maybe next month. I'm doing the rereads this month. Joe Jonah Jameson, if you uh, fire it quickly now in the chat, I maybe will get it for free if you're timely. Cool. Another dark says I missed his, and there it is. I'm still convinced Sansa will warg birds from the veil. Yes. Or that Bran will contact her. Yes. Damn Welsh mythology with Bran and Branwyn has me convinced. I'm going to make a video about that. I'm convinced, too. When we talked about that a few weeks ago, I completely warmed up to the idea. I think it makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so Bran has contacted John already in the dream and awoken his gift. Remember, I just talked about that. He appeared as a tree to John, booped him on the forehead, and then John had his first wolf dream. So I think that, obviously, with Sansa's wolf being dead... Um, the uh, the logical thing for her to skin change would be birds, and there's there's ravens and crows everywhere. So I totally think she'll be skin changing ravens and bird uh, and crows. And I think the brand will contact her and wake up her powers and sort of bring her back into the Stark fold and reawaken her Stark identity, which is slumbering inside of her. And I'm going to make a video about that because, yeah, the Welsh mythology totally points towards that. There's also uh, Edun from Norse mythology that Sansa borrows from that also implies it. So it's a double whammy. The Bran and Branwyn and the Edun connections. Both imply that, uh, that, that Sansa will regain her magic. So I will make a video called Sansa's Magic. And it will be about that. So Jonah's theory is that the final battle of ice and fire will be in the Eerie. Why the Eerie? It has rich moon symbolism. It's made for fighting the others. It was foreshadowed in the Game of Thrones and would be a most valuable piece on the board for Peter. I really don't think so. I don't think the Eerie is important enough. I think that there's moon symbolism everywhere. 
Um, I do think that it would be a good stronghold for surviving from the others. So we could see if we depends on how long the long night goes. I do think it'll go longer than one night. So that means the others will invade Westeros. There'll be a battle at Winterfell. They'll probably go further than Winterfell. So we could see people hold up in the Eyrie, uh, which you could, will only be able to reach by a dragon during the winter. And there are lots of, at least a couple of scenes in the past where dragons have flown up to the Eyrie, which could definitely be foreshadowing. Why didn't the last hero completely wipe out to all the others? Well, that's, that's a really good mystery. Um, I don't have a, a direct answer for that, but I think it has to do with the original sins of Azor Ahai not being totally fixed. So working backwards from what I think is going to be the solution this time, I think that Bran's got to download the Green Seer hive mind out of the Weirwoods and into his Bran brain so that the others can go back into the Weirwoods. So the logical answer is that this was not done before. The, you know, the, the others haven't been able to regain their home. And that's what we need to give to send the others home is to vacate the Weirwoods. So. Cool, guys. Well, I am hungry and my voice is pretty tired. So I will go ahead and say thank you so much coming through with all the PayPal's and super chance. Oh, I see one I'll grab here. So despite being obviously many days dead, Beric insists cat must be resurrected. And when Thoros wouldn't, he did it himself. What is his reason? Perhaps he felt bad for Arya. Perhaps some instinct of lore told him perhaps he was tired and wanted to get some sleep. <laughs> Any of those things. Probably R'hllor told him to do it. That's what I would guess. Danishta, this one's a little esoteric. I'm not sure if George thinks about it this way. She's asking me to talk about the sources of black fire, blue fire, and green fire. I don't think those are different things. They're, they are for symbolism, but I don't think that there's like different magics and different fires and stuff. Um, most interested in what sort of magic is propelling the black fire. So the black fire is a symbol of corrupted fire because fire is supposed to bring light. <clears throat> Lightbringer brings light, but Lightbringer is actually potentially an evil weapon. And the comet that is compared to Lightbringer brought the darkness of the long night, which is why my new video is going to be called Nightbringer. So that's what the black fire is telling us about fire that brings darkness. Um, but all this, this is all symbolism. It's not like a different kind of magic, I don't think. You could say that the shadow magic is a corruption of the original fire magic. That, that could be. Because all the fire magic we have now is, is all tied to shadow. So it could be that it's been corrupted or something like that. Cool, guys. Well, thanks for coming through. Thanks for everything. Thanks for all the PayPal's and uh, I'll be coming back either Tuesday or Wednesday with the uh, burning of the seven on Dragonstone chapter from a clash of Kings, just the first Davos chapter. So I will see you then. You've been a beautiful audience.